Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, let's uh, continue uh, more or less uh, for where we left off. But I just wanted to say before I start, um, so the, the notes from yesterday's lecture are now on the wiki. Uh, so if you go to the, um, the page for this lecture series, it should be there. Uh, I don't promise that there are any typos, but uh, yeah, and then I'll do my best to gradually update it as the week goes on. I uh, guess it depends how much extracurricular fun I'm having, how frequently it'll be updated. Um, okay, uh, so let's first remember where we ended up uh, yesterday. So we uh, introduced this idea that quantum gravity and asymptotically uh, anti de Sitter space is described by some conformal field theory. Uh, and we gave a, more generally, um, given a conformal field theory, we gave a criterion for that conformal field theory to be dual to a ADS space, which is semi-classical. Um, so since that was at the end, let me just, just say it again. So um, it'll take a little while to write, but I think it's worth going through again. Um, so we say um, a, a CFTD uh, has a semi-classical um, dual um, if uh, so then the idea is, um, so in the CFT, there exists a set of primary operators, O sub i. Um, well, that always exists, but they're going to have a property, which I say in a minute. Um, there exists a bulk um, effective action, which depends on some fields phi of i, and also on a, a cutoff lambda. Um, this lambda has to obey that um, it's large in, in units of the inverse ADS radius, uh, uh, but small in Planck units, where Planck units are defined um, using the G Newton that appears in this effective action. Uh, and then clearly for this to be possible, we're going to need that the ADS radius is large in Planck units, right? Otherwise, we can't have both of these things true at the same time. Um, uh, and then these, um, these phi i's is a, a finite set um, of bulk fields. Um, uh, with one metric, G, um, such that um, if we look at the bulk path integral, e to the i, s effective of phi i and lambda, uh, and we compute the expectation value of some operators, O i 1, O i n, where I'll say what those are in a minute, uh, then this is equal to, in the CFT, the expectation values um, of, uh, these sing of these primary operators, uh, oh, sorry, uh, i sub n, x sub n, uh, in the CFT. Uh, and this is supposed to be true um, to all orders in 1 over L times lambda. Um, and then uh, we're supposed to have N be of order um, uh, 1 over L times lambda to the 0. So it means that we shouldn't have a number of these guys which scales with this quantity, which we already said has to be large. Um, uh, and then, or, or small actually, the way I wrote it. Uh, and then finally, to, I have to say what these guys are in terms of the bulk things. So that's given by this extrapolate dictionary, which says that um, if I take the limit as r goes to infinity of a bulk field, uh, and I multiply it by r to the delta, um, I'll call it delta i, uh, um, this should be a phi, phi i um, of r and x, uh, then I get just oi of x, 
And then this is the dimension of this operator in the CFT, which is this primary, uh, right? So, so the, the O on this side is the primary operator in the CFT, and the O on this side is defined by this limiting procedure. So it's really saying that it's an operator equation. This primary operator in the CFT is equal to this extrapolated uh, field in the bulk. Um, okay. So, yeah, there's a lot of information here, so that's why I wanted to go through it again. Uh, so are there any questions about this? Why any of these particular things are needed? Yeah. It's primary. Yeah, I said it, but um, uh, currently no. Yeah. Um, currently no. Um, so I mean, so the so so well, if if you may recall from last time, right, that the. The asymptotic behavior of phi is controlled by the, the mass of phi, right? So this delta i is related to the mass of phi. So delta i is equal to d over 2. And so with the boundary conditions we chose yesterday with the plus sign, um, it's d squared plus 4m squared. Um, so in this effective field theory, uh, we need the masses of all of these guys to be low compared to the cutoff. And so that's going to put a restriction on how high the dimension of O can be. Um, yeah, so that's a restriction on OI, but I think follows from, from everything that I said. Yeah. Uh, yes? No, absolutely not. I just for simplicity wrote that. Yeah, so in, indeed. So for other fields, there will be some indices in, on both sides of this equation. Uh, yeah, so the, so I'm not including higher spin duality as an example of semi class. Uh, th that's not included by this. Yeah, no, I want things with Einstein gravity. Uh, I didn't say the word single trace. I'm going to say it later, but here I didn't say it because what does it mean? Yeah, in order to, I, I'm going to talk about large n in a minute. Uh, and then we'll be able to talk about large n factorization and single trace and double trace. But this definition is more general. No, I didn't say for any primary. I said there's a subset of the primaries which are in one-to-one cor -one correspondence with these bulk fields. But there will, of course, be other primaries, for example, corresponding to very heavy black holes or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rahul? Um, so this is like more of a question. Absolutely not, yes. And we're, that's going to be the next thing we discuss. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're going to, yeah, so that's also currently not included, right? So, yeah, and I was going to discuss that later, but so here, this is a situation where you just have ADS and whatever compact manifold is small. Yeah, so, so n equals 4 won't quite be an example of this. And, and so actually, throughout the lecture series, I'm going to be lazy about this, so I'm going to pretend that there's finitely many fields in the bulk. I think we can modify the definitions to include the KK tower, but it just makes things uglier, uh, so it's easier to just... Uh, I mean, unfortunately, all the examples are like that, so that's okay. But uh, uh, yeah, but I I, I don't want to modify it in a way that allows um, infinitely many fields below any given mass. So I still don't want to allow Vasiliev, but I, I'm willing to allow a KK tower. Uh, and then probably I should respond this, modify this to say, you know, below any finite mass, there's a finite number of fields. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, that's right. So that's part of, so yeah, in, in defining this path integral, the things we integrate over are field configurations that obey the boundary conditions that we discussed yesterday and the, and the you know, versions of those for the metric and so on. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I mean, right, but I mean, in the path integral, it, so, right, so you, you're allowed to integrate over configurations that don't obey the classical equations of motion, but you're not allowed to integrate over coefficient, over configurations that don't obey the boundary conditions. Yeah. Um, okay, any Uh, usually the boundary conditions don't allow that. So I, w I was a little bit lazy about the, about what subleading things are allowed by the boundary conditions, and I think I'll be continue to be lazy about it. But I don't. That I think is, is won't be allowed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, to all orders. 
Well, so this is an effective field theory, right? It's a it's a Wilson action with an explicit cutoff, and so so when you do when you have a Wilson action with a cutoff, it's it's defi you're defining a theory perturbatively in one over the cutoff, and so so here this cutoff is basically G Newton, and or it's at most G Newton, or or maybe you know, so so when you do this expansion, this is like the perturbative quantum gravity expansion. Um, so you might like to call it the large N expansion. I didn't call it that yet because I haven't introduced large N theories yet. So this is a more general notion, right? And so, but roughly speaking, it's set by G Newton here. Uh, so I don't just want to work to leading order in G Newton. That's kind of the main point. This is quantum gravity to all orders and perturbation theory. Um, okay, um, good. So now let me just uh, make a maybe a few comments. So. So, so there are two important um, special cases of this equation. So when you have the, so one local, one primary which always exists in the CFT is the energy momentum tensor, T mu nu, okay? And then uh, that will be dual to a, to, through a version of this equation which has a few more indices um, to the metric field in the bulk, okay? So in the, and that, as we said, the metric always exists. There's always one metric and there's always one energy momentum tensor. Um, moreover, if the CFT has a global, a continuous global symmetry, then it will have a Noether current, J mu, associated to that symmetry. So that will be something that can appear here. And then what we get on the bulk side will be a gauge field uh, with a gauge group, which is specified by the, by the algebra of the, of the currents. Um, well, up to topology. Um, so let me just say, so one check, so we could say, is this a reasonable definition? Um, so one nice check of that, which you should all do if you haven't already, um, check, um, is you take our free scalar theory in ADS that we discussed yesterday, um, and you compute the two-point function uh, in the bulk um, of R x um, five R x prime. Uh, and then take the limit as r goes to infinity, uh, multiplying by r to the two delta. Okay. So, so this is just a, a free field theory com a computation in the bulk to compute this thing. It's a little bit non-trivial. The answer is a hypergeometric function. Um, but okay, at some point you have to learn about hypergeometric functions. So this is one good point to learn about it if you don't already know. Um, and then you just check that when you take this limit. Um, what you recover is is the standard CFT two point function um, on uh, well so if you want to be fancy you can do it on r time on r times sd minus one uh, so this is actually done so it's not done in the notes that I posted but it's sketched in my Jerusalem lectures from several years ago which are on the archive so if you need help doing this you can look there and hopefully there will be enough information to figure it out but I, I encourage you to do it if you haven't. If, if the r times sd one minus one you don't like, then you can do it in the Poincaré coordinates that Joanna talked about earlier in the calculation. They're a little bit easier, um, and then you can do a conformal transformation to get this one. Um, okay, um, good. Let's see. Uh, now I say anything else. Um, all right. So so good. So so now let me get back to Rahul's question. So okay. So this tells us what we um, what we want. Um, but 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 it, so far it doesn't tell us what we can get. Uh, so one thing I can say is that we do have examples of theories that obey this. So the um, Joanna talked this morning about the um, SUN Yang Mills theory with n equals four supersymmetry in uh, four space time dimensions. Uh, so that one you can more or less prove obeys all of these things. Uh, there there's a little bit of well, so, so to be maybe to say a little more explicitly, or you can, so the spectrum of the chiral uh, BPS operators um, gives you these phi i's. Uh, you can, in some simple cases, you can check the correlation functions explicitly. Uh, and then you can, uh, uh, using the large n technology I'll talk about in a minute, make a decent argument that it should work for all of the correlation functions. Uh, it hasn't quite, I wouldn't say, been totally shown for literally every single correlation function. Um, but anyways, that's just some example. And so what we'd really like is some more general criterion on conformal field theories, uh, which is necessary and sufficient for the conformal field theories to obey this. Right? That would be nice. Uh, 
Unfortunately, we don't really have such a criterion in general. Um, we don't yet know, you know, just starting from the you know abstract data of the CFT, what is a necessary and sufficient condition to have a semi-classical dual. Um, what we do have, uh, however, though, is a very promising sufficient condition, uh, which is that the CFT is what's called a gapped large N CFT. So let me uh, explain that a little bit. Um, trying to think. I, might wanna, I think I want to start on a new board, actually. So I'm going to do another one of these long definitions. Sorry, this lecture, there are a couple of these. Um, so, okay, so here's another definition. And, and this, there may be some overlap here with Igor's lectures because he's large N is in his title, but maybe I'll say it in a different way than him, so I should uh, say it again anyway. That's true, yeah, <laughs> right. And you can, you can say if I make a mistake. Um, okay, so the definition is, uh, so um, a gapped um, large N CFT is really, um, it's a family of CFTs. Um, so it's a little bit grammatically incorrect, but this is the standard terminology, so I'm sorry. Uh, it's a family of CFTs labeled um, uh, by N, some parameter, uh, a positive uh, real number, um, such that, and then we need a list of things to be true. Okay, um, so the first thing we need is that um, there exists a finite set of um, single trace uh, primaries um, O sub i, um, which uh, obey the um, condition that if we normalize them so that the two-point function, oi, oi, um, is order n to the zero, um, then the three-point function, oi, oj, ok, um, is, uh, well, let's say less than or equal to, um, in a scaling sense, so not worrying about the coefficient, 1 over n to some power which uh, I will parameterize in a kind of funny way. So I'll call it uh, pound over 2. Pound is a little weird. Maybe I'll call it alpha over 2. Pound is kind of bizarre. Okay, alpha over 2. Uh, so, so this means that the, the three-point functions of all of the single trace operators are parametrically suppressed in n. Right? So that, that's not something that usually happens just you know, for no good reason in, in CFT. So this is a fairly strong restriction. Well, at least on these, op on, on these single trace primary operators. Okay. Is um, alpha supposed to be fixed for the whole family, or is it just... Uh, yeah, 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 sorry. So I should say an alpha, alpha is a fixed thing, which is order n to the zero. Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, so, okay, good. So that's the first requirement. Um, the second requirement is that um, there exists exactly one um, single trace primary, STP, uh, um, with uh, spin 2 and scaling dimension D. Uh, which is T mu nu, the stress tensor. Um, and moreover, um, T, T, T uh, goes like um, 1 over this uh, n to the alpha over 2 uh, with a, with a non-zero coefficient. So, so in general, there might be some symmetry or something. These guys might actually be smaller than this. So I, I haven't necessarily really defined this alpha yet, but here it's really defined. So in the three-point function of the stress tensor, uh, you have this scaling uh, with, a, with, a, with a finite coefficient on top of it. Um, okay. Um, good. Can I fit one more here? I think I can fit one more. Okay. 
three. <laughs> um, for any collection, um, O I one, O I N of single trace primaries, um, there exists a multi trace. Uh, primary um, O I1 I N um, uh, with um, delta I1 I N equals delta 1 plus uh, I1 plus delta I N um, plus uh, something that's uh, higher order in N. So so, and this is also a very strong requirement on the CFT, right? Like, usually if you just take two primary operators, you, you don't expect there to be another primary whose dimension is just the sum of the dimension of those two. Okay. Um. Uh, I'm losing my chalk. Yeah, that's right. We might have to say for some sufficiently, l starting at some sufficiently large finite n. So I mean, I don't want to commit to what happens when n equals two or something. But yes, yeah, they should exist for all sufficiently large n. And are you demanding previous Yes, absolutely. Just hold your horses. There's two more. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, four. So, um, so at leading order. Sorry, this is a bit formal, but I think it's really good to go through this. So at leading order in 1 over n, um, uh, uh, the correlation functions um, of the single trace primaries and multi-trace primaries um, uh, are computed Um, by a wick contraction. So this is the so-called large n factorization. Um, so let me just write two examples so you get the basic idea. So say I, I want to compute the four-point function oi, oi, oj, oj. Uh, then, um, well, at least if i is not equal to j, then this is just oi, oi, oj, oj. Uh, plus things that are higher order in 1 over n. Okay, so again, that's uh, not something that's usually true in CFTs. Um, and, and also, so that's an example with single trace. So then if for now I do oi, oj, oij. So that's one with the multi-trace operator. Then again, it's just oi, oi, oj, oj, uh, where again I've assumed i is not j. Okay. So, so this is large n factorization. Uh, and then finally, what she was getting at is that um, we say that all primaries um, with delta of order n to the 0 are single trace uh, or multi-trace. So there's nothing else in the spectrum uh, at order one dimension. OK. And so I think this is everything that should be on the list. Maybe the experts can think of other things that should be on the list. Um, Sorry, maybe you can clarify what you mean by finite set. Because uh, if I take equal to four, I know it's a large n, it's a set of single trace primaries. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm sorry. I'm focusing on the ones whose dimensions are order one. Yeah, so, I said, yeah, so may, I, maybe I should have already set it up here. Um, well, yeah, I guess it's kind of implicit in the, when I said that the two-point function is order n to the zero. Yes. So, so certainly I'm thinking of them as being uh, order n to the zero, because I want it to be the things that correspond to the bulk fields. No, all primaries whose dimension are of order n to the zero are single trace or multi-trace. 
I, I mean, I think, honestly, if the dimensions of the, quote, single trace operators grow with n, then there can start being trace relations, right? And then it's not really, I mean, you don't necessarily expect these things to be true, right? If I think n could be a billion, right? Yeah. Uh, this is for the well, good, no, no, so, but good. So, so n equals 4 super Yang mills actually doesn't obey this criterion because of the KK modes. That was what was asked before, right? So, indeed. So, so, so yeah, I was going to comment on that before, but let me comment on that now, right? So, Indeed, so n equals 4 is not an example of this because it's not finite. So what you need, so if you want to include that, then you have to allow, roughly speaking, that it's a finite set below any fixed order 1 uh, dimension. But isn't, um, isn't the definition of equals 4? No, 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 but it's, it's, but I, right, let me think of how to say this, right? So I'm, I'm trying to give the sort of skeleton of how the duality works. So the simplest kind of holography you could imagine is one where you don't have this extra compact manifold, where, where all the large dimensions are in the ADS, right? Now, it's true that we don't happen to have examples of that, but nonetheless, this is a set of theories that we study all the, or a you know, conjectural set of theories that we study all the time. No, but no, that's also excluded here too, because so, I mean, because because um, because if the tough coupling is of order 100, then there are interactions that are stronger than gravity. So, what? Uh, well, that depends how that. Or sorry, that depends the limit you work in. So, you want to work in the. <laughs> so so. Okay. Um, no, yeah, that's definitely not an example of this, right? I mean, no, I think I th I think uh, yeah. Um, no, I think there's some, well, okay, we, we, we have to think about it a little bit. I mean, so the, the, the limit I like is the one where, uh, you know, G string is finite and n goes to infinity and then lambda also goes to infinity, right? So, I mean, yeah, I guess the one where, the one where lambda is finite, I guess I, I think, yeah, probably what I would say is there's sort of an infinite number of these uh, operators, right? Because there are all these stringy That's modes. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I, I'm granting you that n equals four does not obey this. So I'm not sure what you, what else you want. I mean, so th this is what you would have if you had a theory which was dual to ADS gravity without the compact manifold and with the, all the interactions at no, the, the suppressed by gravity. Um, yeah, no, but I, I think I, again I'm just saying I excluded that, right? I mean, so the, the thing which the thing which this uh, is supposed to be dual to is something where the string scale is of order the Planck scale. Okay, that that's what I'm trying to describe here. Okay, and and I agree that that's not all that there is that's interesting, but it, it just it makes the discussion more complicated if we want to also you know account for all of these possibilities. So I mean, so this is a thing where I think it could well be that there are theories like this we don't currently know any, at least I don't. Um, but the, the following discussion that we give in the rest of the lectures, I think, would continue to be true if we were more careful about these things, but then it would just be a pain in the butt to keep track of them. Um, yeah. Okay. So, well, it's good we had that discussion now that I don't have to say it later. I was going to say it in a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, good. So, so, well, yeah. So, in, in a free field theory, first of all, um, the stress tensor correlate three point function is order one in the in the in the limit where uh, where the, in the normalization where T T is were also order one. I mean it's just order one. There's no N around, right? So what this what this is equivalent to is what's called generalized free fields uh, in the strict large N limit. Uh, but 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 then you know here the idea is that really in the end you you want to keep track of the corrections at large at, in one over n and then it goes beyond generalized free fields. Okay. So okay. So so all right. Um, so now okay. So now now let's say the claim. Um, so the claim um, is that uh, these theories. Um, are uh, semi-classical, or they have semi-classical duals. Um, uh, and the, the paper, which is probably the best paper to read about this, um, which I, is mentioned in the, in, in the notes online, is this paper by Himskirk, uh, Penedonis, Polchinski, and Sully. Uh, 
2009 or 2010, I think it's 2009. Um, but anyway, the reference is online. Um, so, and so, so let's now uh, try to unpack that a little bit. So, so the basic idea is that um, these, uh, these single trace OIs indeed are the OIs that we had over there, which correspond to the finite set of bulk fields. Um, then um, if we look at the three-point function of the stress tensor, in the bulk, that corresponds to the gravitational interaction, right? So, so in the bulk, this is of order square root of g. So this tells us that, um, that a g is of order uh, 1 over n uh, to the alpha. Um, so this tells us the interpretation of uh, n uh, from the bulk point of view. It's precisely this g Newton. Um, so then um, this, uh, this large n factorization, what it's telling us is that not only are the gravitational interactions weak, but the other interactions are also weak. So for example, if you instead look at the three-point function of a scalar, you know, uh, O, 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 in the bulk that's phi, 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 and then this is telling you that, for example, if there's a scalar three-point vertex there, that also needs to be suppressed by some power of n. So, so the theories that these would be dual to are kind of very simple theories in some sense from the bulk point of view because if you like, there's sort of no interesting particle physics. All of the interactions are, at the gra are suppressed by G Newton. Um, you know, there's no alpha equals 1 over 137. Uh, whereas, whereas that would have been allowed by the general def definition over here. Um, Okay, so 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 that suggests you know what the properties of this bulk theory would be, but right, but I mean what the claim really says though is that this is not the property of the large gap. This is the general large gap. Uh, this yes, yeah, 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 that's right. No, but the the the, the large gap uh, is there to you know for so that there's a finite number of fields, um, and that I mean well let let me finish what I was saying right so. So, so, so this, these are the properties that if a, if a local bulk theory existed, right, then it would have these properties. But what the claim really says is that given a CFT, which obeys one through five, we can actually find this S effective, this local bulk effective action whose correlation functions reproduce the correlation functions in the CFT. And that's the thing that wouldn't be true without the gap condition. Um, so that's, what, that's the argument which is made in this paper. I have to say it's not a completely rigorous and complete argument. Uh, it's more like a, a proposal which then they check in various cases and it seems to work. So the idea, and I don't, I don't want to go through the details of this paper, it's fairly complicated, um, is that you assume that you have some CFT with this spectrum of operators, just these single trace and multi-trace operators and nothing else whose dimension is order n to the zero. Then you look at the CFT bootstrap um, that she was talking about um, uh, for um, OI, OIJ, et cetera. Um, and you try to parameterize solutions of the crossing equation for the four-point function of these kinds of things, okay? So you, you write down the four-point function, you expand in terms of the OPE coefficients, which you interpret as free parameters, uh, and then you try to parameterize all of the solutions for the OPE coefficients. And then what is shown in this paper, at least in some special cases, and I think is probably likely to be true in general, is that all of the parameters in the, in the bootstrap solution for these operators um, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with terms um, in S effective of phi i and lambda. Um, so so any, any, any solution of the bootstrap for the O's which obeys this N scaling and has the gap is, is going, you're going to actually be able to find from that this S effective um, such that that's true, okay. So, so far you haven't made any statement about how fast the gap grows with N. Do you need such a statement? Like there's a scale like N to some power? I mean, we're all primaries of order N zero, but, but when, when does that fail? 
Yeah, so I, I think, uh, I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I, I was wondering about that. I'm not sure if I can give you a completely convincing argument about that. I mean, it should be some power event. But, yeah, but whether the power should be related to the power that it, to this alpha is something that it's less clear to me. It could be that there's an intermediate scale. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I'm actually not sure, though, because, well, it depends. So, he, see, here I assume that the, th the OP coefficients of the O's are suppressed with the same alpha that appears here. And so then I guess I would be a little bit skeptical if you could have the gap be lower than the Planck scale and, and still satisfy this. No, if, if any but I'm not actually sure. Yeah. We know that basic properties such as the M2 grain theory. Yeah. I think we don't actually know how the gap scale is put in. Um, well, let's see. So in the M2, so of course in the M2 story, there is the, there's the KK tower, which we have to no, split out. But I th yeah, good. So that's a great question. So I, I thought that in the M2 brain, the ABGM theory, that well, the... K equals one. Yeah, K equals one ABGM. That the, I thought that the, the gap is supposed to go up to the Planck scale. I don't know. In principle, that can be studied. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's yeah, I'm not sure how you can study. I mean, you can't study that with integrability, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you would show that. But I think that that's the lore. I mean, I think from the bulk point of view, that's what you expect, right? Yeah. So then, so then, if the duality is correct, then it must be true. But I, 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 fine. Yeah. I mean, you you could, I suppose, in in that theory with the n scaling of the operators you know about, study the bootstrap and try and show that 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 that, that kind of needs to be the case. But I'm not sure. Um, okay. So. Um, some, some funny fraction power of n, right? And, okay, so I think uh, like three halves or something? Yeah. yeah. I'm just yeah. saying that that power seems yeah. to be hard to infer directly, knowing all the things you wrote on board. So is there anything in the... Well, I don't know. I thought if you know the TTT, I mean, you know, right? I mean, yeah, if you know TTT, you know G Newton, right? So, yeah. Um, okay. So I, I want to stop and see if there are any other questions because this is kind of this is kind of a lot to hit you with all at once. But I think I think this is you know although this is not a completely satisfactory story. I mean as we've been discussing, there are examples that don't fit into this framework. This is at least one set of set of theories where you can really try to understand in detail how the correspondence works at a rather general level. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, it will necessarily have higher curvature theories because this is an effective action here. So, so each solu the different, the different um, terms, the different parameters in the bootstrap solution will correspond to coefficients of, you know, r squared, r to the fourth, this kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think you'll be able to get a situation where the coefficient of the Einstein term is zero, though. But, but no, no self-respecting person should want <laughs> such a theory anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's a little bit more specified in this definition, but if you specialize this to be equal to sort of in the relationship. Yeah, I was actually yeah, I was about to talk about that. So yeah, just uh, hold off a sec. Yeah. Um any other questions? Okay. Um So I just want to give you one other sort of heuristic argument about these large n theories, which I think is helpful in clarifying how holography is working in them. So, so far, for the most part, we've just been talking about excitations of the vacuum, right? Like, so here we were talking about the order one number of operators uh, sitting inside of the vacuum. Um, but if we really want holography b to be correct, then we also need to think about high energy states, for example, with black holes in them. Um, so as, as she reminded me uh, yesterday, um, if you're willing to write this formula in Euclidean signature, you can, uh, you can start saying something about that. Um, but I wanted to give kind of a more nuts and bolts uh, picture of how that works here. Um, so what I want to do is I just want to say, OK, let's take the CFT and let's think about the thermal entropy and energy at finite temperature at, at sufficiently high temperature so that in the bulk we expect there to be a black hole. I think Joanna didn't actually talk about black holes yet, but you're probably going to, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, 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 so if you've never seen it before, which would surprise me, then you'll see it tomorrow. But uh, it happens to be, or it is true, that at temperatures which are higher than the inverse ADS radius, then the states which dominate in the bulk are big black holes sitting in the center of ADS. 
So let's see if we can reproduce that intuition from the CFT side, starting with these kind of N kind of arguments. Um, so I'm going to pull a sleight of hand here, and so maybe people will complain, but I think it's correct, although not totally rigorous. So we have to think about what is the interpretation of this N from the CFT point of view. Um, now, uh, in the N equals 4 theory, we know, right, because this N is, so it, in case you don't know, right, so for the N equals 4 theory, this alpha is 2, and then N is just the N of SUN. Uh, so it has something to do with the number of degrees of freedom in the CFT. Um, so if we work at high temperature, um, we might expect that the entropy should go like some power of n, since it's somehow counting numbers of degrees of freedom. And then, uh, well, at high temperature on the sphere, it should just be extensive, right? It should be the volume of the sphere in units of the temperature. Um, so uh, that'll be t to the d minus 1. Uh, and then this, now this power, let's think about what this power should be. Well, a priori, I guess we don't necessarily know, but now here's the part where I'll cheat a little bit. So from the bulk side, we know that G Newton is 1 over N to the alpha. So that means that in front of the action in the bulk, there's a 1 over G. So it means there's an N to the alpha in front of the action in the bulk in, in, the, in the large N limit. So then it suggests that you should think of N to the alpha as being the thing which counts the degrees of freedom. So I'm going to put in alpha here. That's a little bit hand wavy, but I think it's not, it's, you know, it's not, too, it's not too dishonest. Otherwise, we could put another power there, and then we'll determine it by the end of this calculation. Um, so similarly, we can, uh, we can compute the thermal energy of the CFT. So it'll be the n to the alpha again for the same reason. And now it'll be a t to the d uh, by dimensional analysis. So again, it should be extensive, but we need an extra factor of the temperature. Um, so then um, combining these equations, uh, we find that the thermal entropy should go like n to the alpha over d times e to the d minus 1 over d, uh, just based on these sort of general grounds. You know, n is counting degrees of freedom. Things should be extensive. So now let's compare that to what we expect in the bulk. So uh, you may remember we wrote down yesterday the ADS Schwarzschild solution, dt squared f of r um, plus dr squared over f of r uh, plus r squared d omega squared. So then, um, so you know from the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, right, that the entropy should be the area in over, over 4g. Uh, so, but to find the area, we need to find the horizon. So, so if you look at the f that we wrote down yesterday, you see that the, the horizon, um, the r, r Schwarzschild to the d, uh, goes like g times m, where m is the mass of the black hole. So is that just comes from looking at this f of r as sufficiently large rs, then this is where the root is. So that's the horizon radius. Um, so then using that, we can compute um, s is a over 4g. Um, so, so a is uh, rs to the d minus 1 over 4g. Um, Right, so then if we, if we raise this to whatever the, the, the 1 over d to the d minus 1, um, then indeed we find that we just get g to the minus 1 over d um, uh, times m to the d minus 1 over d. Um, and now if you, if you remember that um, g is 1 over n to the alpha, then you see we've got a perfect match here in the scaling between the CFT and the bulk. Um, so to me, this is kind of the heuristic, you know, I mean, and at a heuristic level, this is actually one of the nicest things about ADS-CFT because it really shows you the holographic nature of the correspondence, right? So you, you know, in, in the boundary, you know, the entropies are extensive as usual, but in the bulk, they're sub-extensive because black hole uh, entropy only grows with the area. Uh, and then if you think about where the coefficients go, you see that they line up. Um, so, so, so this is sort of a check that, you know, that this, these large end theories aren't holographic just around the vacuum. They're also holographic in very excited states, you know, because remember the, the full duality is supposed to be an isomorphism of the Hilbert spaces, right? So every state is supposed to be matched on the two sides. And this gives you some sense of how it works. 
Okay, so, so that was the end of lecture number one. Um, now we move to lecture number two, notebook number two. Yeah. When you talk about the origin of the theory, they all have to be gay, right? No, I don't. He's the only one here for uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, so I, I actually, so I actually don't think that it's very well defined whether a CFT is a gauge theory or not. But you're saying that there is some OS or No, but I didn't say that. No, but I defined I defined all the terms here, so I, n I never had to use any matrices or vectors or anything. The the the, the thing that I used to define it was large n factorization. Yeah. You will never end up with an unpaid domain model. Um, because that has operators that are not single, neither single frame, double frame. Yeah. Just like pi i or. No, I, yeah, I, agree that, I agree that the ON model without the constraint is not a large N theory according to this definition. Um, but I don't, I don't want to say that the only holographic CFTs are gauge theories. I, I, th that's not a statement I want to make. I think we can define the, all of the, the, of course, the, the historical origin of these terms, single trace and multi-trace and large M, comes from gauge theory. But I, I hopefully it's clear that the definitions which are important for reproducing holography do not need to use this gauge theory language at all. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but I just like separation into single yeah, sure. But I just assume that the CFT has these properties, right? So the only, th I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't, s I'm not talking about any particular CFT. I just, you know, I, I just have some CFT which obeys these things. Yeah, of course, but there are lots and lots of CFTs which aren't dual to semi-classical gravity, right? So, sorry, I mean, the Ising model doesn't obey this either. Is there a family of CFTs that actually your criteria? I, I don't have a, s a concrete example. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but if, if we slightly modify it to include the KK tower, then there will be. Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, that's just to be, that's just to make things a little bit easier. I, I don't think that's morally dishonest. Um, no, I, no, but I don't know what that means. I, I don't. I do not know what it means for a CFT to be a gauge theory. You give me the OP coefficients and the operator dimensions. Uh, is it a gauge theory? I don't know. I mean, gauge theory is something about the unphysical Hilbert space, which doesn't exist. So I don't. Well, like if there is generous multiplicity of operators. Well, that just might be because there's some global symmetry or something, right? I mean, I, I really don't think that it. I mean, gauging is a redundancy of description, right? It's not a fundamental property of the theory. You know, I mean, in we, you know, we can talk. You know, when things are weakly coupled, you can talk about having massless photons and so on. But you know, in some CFT on the sphere, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as you know, right? There are dualities which change the gauge group, right? So I mean, it's not a, you know, it's the same theory. So somehow, there can't be that much physics in this gauge group. Well, like if there is large n, then you have, uh, you can, for example, you are excluding theories that have multiple s. Uh, dimension draws x to some power, right? That you are excluding. I mean, I'm fine with excluding multiples of s, including multiples of s before, but not multiples of OM or s. And also, you have certain. Yeah, but I mean, I'm happy to exclude. I mean, I, I'm what I'm trying to exclude are theories that don't have holographic duals. Now, as she and, and someone else I mean, was emphasizing, I, I was a little bit too strong in my excluding, but I, only a little bit. I mean, I think if we if we if we throw back in the KK tower, then I think this you know there are lots of theories like this. But still, most theories are not like this, right? You know, QCD is not like this. You know, and nor should it be, right? Because we don't think it has a semi-classical dual. Um. Um, I, I thought there's this, well, I'm not an expert in this, but I thought there was this whole story about the gravity duel of Kalbanov Stressler. Right, I mean. I mean, I should leave that, I should ask you guys, but I, I, th I, thought, I thought you can have, uh, you know, cyber dualities at large end. Yeah, yeah, I understand. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, these are some really interesting discussions. Yeah, sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so 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 that, that that was that was all I wanted to say about this sort. So that that was the end of the sort of overview of holographic theories and uh, ADS CFT dictionary and so on. Um, Okay, good. Uh, all right, so so now let me go on. So 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 far, what we've been talking about is um, the observables we've been computing are correlation functions of local operators in the CFT. Uh, so correlation functions of local operators in the CFT, as we just discussed, um, are related to sort of scattering type questions in the bulk where we act sort of with a bulk local operator here and maybe another one there. And then, you know, stuff evolves in or something. Uh, and then at some later time, we, we put in some more local operators, you know, and, and we sample what, what came out of the scattering. So, so the, these boundary correlation functions um, are, like, uh, are, are like, you know, the S matrix in flat space somehow there. And, and a great advantage of them is that, you know, even though there's quantum gravity or whatever going on in the bulk, these boundary correlators are very well defined. Because out near the boundary, the boundary conditions sort of ensure you that nothing too crazy is going to be going on. And so these, 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 these observables are going to make sense, if you like, in all the states of the CFT. Um, so th it's nice, but it's also a little bit unsatisfying because... Well, if we really understood this duality, you might think that we should be able to ask about what's going on right in the center. We shouldn't have to wait until whatever happened in the center, everything comes out, and then we see what happened. And, you know, to make that, that seem a little bit more of a serious problem, right, we can consider a situation where there's a black hole, so like this, this ADS Schwarzschild geometry. Um, so, you know, we could send in some initial states here. You know, and then, and, you know, maybe something happens up here. There's some high energy collision. Uh, but then whatever happened in here now, it comes out up here and it goes into the singularity. So it never makes it back to the boundary. Um, so, so if you want to know this kind of question, you know, what happens behind the black hole horizon in ADS CFT, it seems like the dictionary that we've discussed so far is not going to be up to the task. Um, you know, because... Because, you know, to the extent that whatever went in here came out, I mean, maybe it does come out, but, you know, in the Hawking radiation or something, but it comes out in some very complicated way. Uh, and we don't, you know, I mean, uh, cer certainly, you know, we don't know how to phrase it in terms of some low point correlation function or something. Um, so, so, so what we might like to do, what I certainly would like to do, and indeed, uh, since you're a captive audience, what we're going to do for the next lecture or maybe two lectures is we're going to try to understand in the CFT how to explicitly write down operators in the center of the bulk as operators in the CFT. Um, we're, you know, so we're going to try and back off of that extrapolate dictionary. Don't take the Argos to infinity limit and think about phi sitting somewhere in the center of the bulk. Um, so, so this procedure it has a name. It's, it's kind of a weird name. I don't really like it, but it's a standard name, so I'll, so I'll say it. Uh, reconstruction. So it's called bulk reconstruction. All right, that, that's, that's defined as trying to find an operator in the CFT, which is dual to some sort of local operator in the bulk. Um, yeah, the re is kind of funny. I don't know. I guess somehow, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's like you sort of, you construct it in the bulk, and then you now kind of want to reconstruct it in the CFT or something. But, yeah. So just a question. Even if in principle we know how to do bulk reconstruction, you have to Well, I'm not sure. I mean, wh why don't you ask after we write down some formulas? And I mean, you know, I'll, I'll do computations, and you can decide whether you're satisfied with them. I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah. You, I mean, usually with these kinds of conceptual questions, you 
you don't actually need to like you know run it all the way through and compute the answer. Just knowing how to formulate the problem is already very instructive. And hopefully, I'll convince you that that's the case here in the next few lectures. Um, okay, so the bulk reconstruction problem uh, represents um, you know phi of r t and omega in the CFT. Now, yeah, of course, of course. You, you know, you can't just write down whatever you want, right? No, I mean, yeah, yeah. The lecture is not stopping here. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so, but, 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 but before we try to do it, there, you, there are probably some complaints that some of you are already mulling over. So let's let's get them out in the open so that we're all on the same page. Okay, so, so, so let's, let's consider some complaints about this, this uh, proposal. Okay, so complaint number one is that phi of r, t, and omega um, is not a gauge invariant. Right, so in the bulk we have a diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity, uh, and local operators, what do they mean? I mean, what does this r and t and omega mean anyways, right? I mean, we somehow you know, chose some random coordinates in the bulk, but that can't mean anything. Okay. So, um, so this is a thing that we have to consider. Um, I'm not going to present the answer in detail, again, sort of for the same reason I'm not going to talk about the KK modes, which is, you know, we could do it, but it would just make things a little more tedious. But the basic idea is that when you define this thing, it's really a non-local operator that has some sort of dressing that attaches it to the boundary. So you may be familiar f with this already from quantum electrodynamics, right? If you have the, the field that creates an electron, I think actually this came up in the discussion yesterday. Um, you, know, the f you know, the field that creates an electron in QED is not a gauge invariant operator. But you can take a Wilson line and run it off to the boundary, and that defines an operator which is gauge invariant. And so these operators that we're talking about, they're always going to implicitly have some sort of dressing attached to them. Uh, but, but, but we won't, for the most part, have to deal with that dressing explicitly, so I won't discuss it explicitly. And then, you know, if at some point you're really confused about it, you can ask me and I'll say, what happened to the dressing? Sorry, but uh, if you allow dressing, you have to worry about the definition of microcausality. Uh, well, no, the definition of microcausality is that the operator, including all of its dressing, has to commute with something else, including all of its dressing, provided that the operator and the dressing are all mutually space-like separated. Yeah. Okay, so that's complaint number one. Um, complaint number two uh, is, um, you know, uh, well, um, we know that entropy goes like area, as we just discussed. So, um, so there can't be some, you know, ball, some, you know, non-perturbatively some, some, you know, some fields phi, you know, phi of, of x and some some action which is local in the bulk. Okay, um, and uh, well, we've already sort of got some sense of. Right, I mean, in, in some some deep sense, this is true, right? I mean, you know, gravity is holographic. It's not true that you know all the states in the CFT are described by some local action in the bulk, right, where where stuff is an integral over d plus one dimensions. Um, but we've sort of already been discussing that at some length here, right? So, so what we what we what a way of formulating what we said is we said there's a set of states where you take the vacuum and you act with sort of not too many of the uh, phi's or the o's. And in that subspace, uh, you you can expect and actually you can even construct this local bulk effective action. Um, but then you know if you get to sort of too many uh, too many states, then you run into this black hole territory, and the and the, the description in terms of the bulk effective action becomes more subtle. Um, so and and that's the thing which actually we're going to try to understand in a lot more detail as the lectures go on. Um, but you know if you're worrying about this already, don't worry. I mean it's an important thing to worry about, and and this is ultimately the thing which tells you that these bulk effective field theory that you reconstruct is only going to be perturbative in 1 over n. You know, it's not really going to be a, a non-perturbatively precise thing. Um, but to all orders in 1 over n is pretty good. If you compute what is e to the minus 1 over g in our universe, it's pretty small. Uh, certainly, we haven't uh, probed it experimentally. All right. Um,
So I have like 15 more minutes, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to start with a simple example. So um, I'm just going to start with, a, with reconstructing, a, again, the, the free scalar um, in ADS. So fortunately, we already studied that theory yesterday. Um, so uh, you probably remember what we learned yesterday is that phi of r, t, and omega um, is equal to a sum over this frequency quantum and then angular momentum, uh, psi n l of r e to the minus i omega n l t um, y l m of omega a n l m, where this was the annihilation operator, and then we had the we had the Hermitian conjugate. Okay, so that was the that was the free scalar field theory in ADS from the bulk side. Um, so then the, the algorithm that we're going to use to do this reconstruction, maybe, maybe I should write this here, actually. There's a, so there's a general algorithm we're going to follow, um, which is to solve um, the bulk equations of motion um, in from the boundary um, using uh, the extrapolate dictionary, which roughly speaking says that the limit, well, let's write it again, um, of phi equals O as boundary conditions, right? So, so that should at least make, make it plausible that something like this could be done, right? You know, we, the bulk equations of motion, which are something that we determined from the S effective that we reconstructed, um, our PDEs, uh, we can solve those PDEs, this operator equations going in from the boundary using this dictionary as the boundary conditions. Okay, so, so let, let's, see, let's now quickly do that, see how that works uh, for the free scalar field. Um, so, well, so we've already, here we've already solved the, the bulk equations of motion, right? Because we're working, if, if, you like, if you like, at leading order in 1 over n, so the, the bulk equation of motion is just the free wave equation for the scalar, and this is the solution. Uh, as an operator equation. So, so to finish, we just need to use the boundary conditions uh, to pin down what these operators are uh, in terms of the CFT operators. Um, so so the, what the boundary condition tells us, right, is that, um, let me think of how to say this. Um, well, you remember from last time that this psi of N, uh, L, this psi of R, well, there's some coefficient of proportionality and L, and then it goes like R to the minus delta, right? That was, the, that was that large R behavior of psi that we discussed yesterday. So then you see if I take this operator and I plug it into this equation, well, I, min I multiply by R to the delta. So that um, cancels the R to the minus delta here sitting in psi. Um, so then we just see that... Uh, um, when we do the extrapolation, we find that O of T and omega um, is equal to sum on N L M uh, e to the minus I omega N L T. Uh, there's a N N L from, from here, from the asymptotic form of psi. Um, there's a spherical harmonic Y L M. Uh, there's A N L M, and then there's a Hermitian conjugate. Um, so now you see we're actually doing pretty well because what this tells us is that um, these annihilation and creation operators in the bulk for the scalar field are really just the Fourier transforms of this boundary primary operator O of T and omega. So this is an equation, right? It says CFT equals bulk, but it's, it's an equation which is quite easy to solve. So, so let's just uh, make it a little bit more explicit on the next board. Um,
Okay. Um, so by uh, by doing the Fourier transform, what this tells us is that um, the uh, so say I, say I, um, I integrate say from minus pi to pi dt um, e to the i omega n l t. I integrate d omega y l m star of omega o of t and omega. All right, so I can, uh, this is just a definition. Uh, then, um, well, using this, right, I see that this is just going to be equal um, to uh, N, uh, NL, ANLM. And now once I have a CFT representation of the annihilation operator, which I have here, I can just substitute it back into this formula, and it gives me a CFT representation of this phi at any point in the bulk. Um, in fact, we can we can even make it a little bit so so we you know if you don't like momentum space we can we can go back to position space now, and we can rewrite this as saying that phi of r and t and omega is just equal to the integral minus pi to pi dt prime integral d omega prime uh, of some function k plus of r t omega t prime omega prime um, o plus of t prime omega prime uh, plus Hermitian conjugate um, where then this k is the sum on NLM, uh, NL inverse, FNLM of RT omega, e to the i omega NLT prime, uh, T prime, uh, YLM star of omega prime. Okay, so this is just doing Fourier transforms, nothing, nothing too fancy. Uh, oh, and then this FNLM is just this, uh, this whole thing here is, is FNLM. Okay? Um. Okay, um, good. So, so this K has a name. It's called the smearing function. Uh, and ba basically it says, you know, okay, so here's, here's pi and here's minus pi. You know, we have some phi in here. And then it's just saying that we can represent the operator in the CFT just by inter integrating this operator O, which is dual to phi, against some kernel um, over this uh, subregion of the boundary. Um, so I, I don't know. I, is this explicit? I don't know. It seems explicit to me. I mean, it's not. You can say it's not completely explicit in the sense that, you know, I have to use the CFT operator at, at different times in the same equation, and those different times are related by the Hamiltonian evolution in the CFT, which is very complicated, right? So an operator, which is a local operator at some particular time, if you evolve it in time, right, it, it, it grows to become some very complicated, uh, some complicated thing, non-local thing. Um, um, let me think how to say this. Um, well, we, we, can, we can think about this in two different ways. So, um, so the, the two-point function of this phi, sort of just by the symmetry, is going to be correct. Um, if you think about higher orders, I would say, no, it's not obvious that it obeys that. And so the thing that tells you that, obeys, that it obeys it is that we're assuming that we're in a, a CFT with a semi-classical dual. So if you're in a CFT with a semi-classical dual, then it has to. Because, because if you know the if you know all of the boundary correlation functions of O, 
then um, this relationship that we're discussing here is also just true in the bulk theory, right? We're just, we're just representing the solution of the wave equation in the middle by something that's there at the outside. So as long as we use the right equations of motion from, from S effective, then the algebra of the operators will also be correct. Yeah, yeah I was going to comment on that a little bit more later, but it's good to emphasize now. Um, Okay, let, 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 me, let me make um, one other comment about this. So, yeah, maybe it's a little bit unfamiliar, but it's really not that bad. Um, the other comment is that there's a little bit of non-uniqueness in the choice of this function k. So we've derived here an example of a k that works by just sort of following our nose and going, going through. But you see that since I'm, I'm you know, a leading order in 1 over n, I'm integrating this k against an operator um, whose, whose, whose uh, frequencies in T are quantized. So remember this omega NL is delta plus uh, L plus 2N. Um, so then I'm allowed to modify K by, by adding to it something which integrates to zero against here, just because, you know, which you can arrange since not all of the frequencies are represented. Uh, so. That, le that gives you a little bit of freedom in choosing this smearing function. Uh, and there's one particularly nice alternative choice which I want to emphasize. Um, so here it's kind of funny. So wherever you put the operator in the bulk, it's always integrated from minus pi to pi on the boundary. So that's a little weird, right? Like what, what if the operator is like way up here, you know, or, or way down here? Isn't it a little bit weird in the CFT that we're always representing it from, from minus pi to pi? I mean, and of course, the reason we can do that is because there's this periodicity, because because omega is quantized, right? That's what it, that's what it, that's what allows us to change where we represent it. Um, but there's a choice which is probably more intuitive, where instead of always having the integral be from minus pi to pi, so so here here we uh, we shift k um, uh, so to get a new expression um, phi. Uh, so let me use a shorthand notation. So little x is the bulk and capital X is the boundary. The capital X, k of little x, big X, O of big X, um, where now um, the integral on the boundary is over a region, uh, maybe I'll call it d sub little x, which is the set of all points on the boundary which are space-like separated from little x. So, so let, me, let me draw the picture. Um, so say, I don't know, say, say little x is here. Then to get the set of points on the boundary which are space-like separated, we draw this, this light cone. Uh, and then there's some sort of thing like that, right? And then, well, there's their color. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so then this D is, uh, is like this, uh, well, the color looks white, but okay. <laughs> the D is sort of the shaded region here. That's, uh, that's dx, okay? And that's a little bit nicer, right? So now, 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 now there's a more uh, correlation between where the operator is in the bulk and what's the region that you integrate it against. Uh, you know. So now let me just quickly say one easy way to understand why you can make a k like this. So in this representation, I can just say, say I, put the, I happen to put the operator right in the center at t equals 0, right? So then now, now it's true that this region that we integrated over is just all the points that are space-like separated from the operator. So now instead, when we move the operator around, instead of keeping this region fixed, we can just do a conformal transformation. So when we move the operator, we just conjugate it by a conformal transformation, and then that will just deform, move this region around in just the right way that it'll continue to be all the points which are space-like separated from x. Um. Okay, so I think this is actually more or less um, a good stopping point. So the next thing I was going to do is explain how to extend this to interactions. Um, so, so far this is kind of a little bit too trivial to be interesting because it's just sort of kinematical. You know, we're just uh, solving the free equation. It's all determined by conformal symmetry. We use conformal symmetry to move it around, uh, you know. Uh, so, I mean, okay, what did we really learn? I mean, in particular, you know, we... Uh, we didn't have to use that the CFT was a large N CFT, for example. You know, we didn't have to use that, you know, the theory in the bulk was local, right? You know, so, so, it, so in order to use that, you know, for that stuff to matter, we have to go to higher order in 1 over N and understand interactions. Um, 
And so the the really nice thing, which people understood, you know, last five, ten years or so, is that that is possible in a fairly nice way to, to extend this story to include the interactions perturbatively. Um, so I, I think I'll start with that tomorrow, and uh, we can all have uh, caffeine or whatever now. All right, thanks. <laughs> Check if there's still people out there. scientific organizers for the school, so we're all very grateful to him for uh, putting all of this program together for you. He's going to talk about large end models. Yeah, thank
Thank you very much, Oliver, and I'm very grateful to to all the organizers from here in Boulder because uh, they're doing definitely the bulk of the work. And, uh, uh, oh, Tom, the <laughs> <laughs> I set the boundary condition. And then <laughs> yeah, Tom, Oliver, Emily have been absolutely great, and I'm happy to be in Boulder. Actually, coming to Tessie, uh, can't help reminiscing a bit. I was a student in Tessie in 1985 before it was in Boulder. Actually, there was a period of five years when it started, I think, in 84 at the University of Michigan. And then for five years, it moved every year to a new place. So 85 was at Yale. Uh, then I don't remember precise sequence. I think it was at Brown in 87 or 88. And then people realized that uh, it has to be automatized somehow because to do it from scratch every year is incredibly hard. And also some of these uh, destinations were less popular than others. And then <laughs> 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 some were more popular than others. Uh, and then s since 1989, it's been here in Boulder. And actually, the first time I lectured was in Tessie. 1989, when Tom was the, the scientific director, and it was called From Actions to Answers. Uh, I won't tell you what I lectured about. It was, in retrospect, it's not very <laughs> important. But it, it was. <laughs> uh, I have a copy of the proceedings. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and, and it was about wormholes and how the cosmological constant is exactly zero, but since then we found out. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> but then definitely the highlight of my testy career was back in 1999, which I think was the second. Which was the year that I was a Exactly. I was going to mention that. This was an extremely exciting school where many lecturers, so the ADS, DFT, uh, kind of materialized mainly in 97, 98, and then 99. There were many, uh, many series of lectures about that. It was extremely exciting, and and many of the students I'm happy to see are now professors in uh, in various nice yeah, places. At least a dozen. I guess. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, and Oliver. I remember you very well. Also, another person I remember well is Lou Bershmato. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he knew a tremendous amount. I mean, it was, it was clear. He, he apparently solved all the problems in Polchinski's string book. And no, it was an extremely exciting. And uh, so uh, I looked back at my Tessie lecture. So uh, Johanna's lectures inspired me to remember this D3 brain perspective. So I'm not really going to talk about it, but uh, uh, if you want to read about like the thinking in those days, it's maybe a bit outdated <laughs> in some ways. But uh, was uh, uh, and you'll hear more from her. But so one thing about this uh, stacking brain perspective is that you stack a large number of these three brains, and then it creates this curved metric. But you have to remember that this uh, three brain metric has an extra one. It's not exactly an ads -DFT. What you get. As R goes to zero, then you get ADS5 crosses 5 in Poincare coordinate. But, you, uh, but the one makes it kind of open up at large R into flat 10 dimensional space. And that was the perspective that some of us used in, in those days. So you can send like a wave packet from the asymptotically flat space, and it kind of tunnels into ADS space. So it gives you, so if you want to read about that perspective, uh, you can read it there. And uh, so the power of large N, so in retrospect, one thing that large N gave us is uh, almost 20 years of ADS-CFT in a sense, because uh, most, most tests of ADS-CFT really very much rely on large N. So we, we know little beyond the large N limit. So as, as you heard, for example, in ADS-CFT, there are uh, two two important things. One is this sort of Toft large n limit. Uh, Toft large n, where you send g and mills to zero, uh, and you send n to infinity, and you keep lambda, which is g and mills squared, n fixed. Okay. 
but uh, so the, the generic thing is precisely this. Lambda does not have to be large, okay? And this doesn't rely on any details of the theory. This type of large end limit in some sense exists in a huge variety of theories, right? Uh, for example, QCV, <laughs> uh, etc. So, uh, so certainly what we know relies on, uh, on this limit, but then we have this sort of, uh, I would say, so this is generic, generic fault large n. And then there is what I would call rare event. Rare event <laughs> is the possibility, possibility to, to take, uh, take lambda to infinity and obtain, uh, obtain weakly curve dual. Uh, weakly, obtain lambda to the four being much, much greater than alpha prime squared. By the way, so some of what I'm going to say is uh, like a little bit like the reverse of, of what Dan, uh, Daniel Harlow just told us because he, he, he wanted to start from ADS and sort of go to CFT and I want to start uh, more from the CFT perspective or just field theory perspective and see which parts of it give us ADS. But, but I think the applicability of large and limit is kind of more general than just ADS. I mean, ADS is one of the great things about it, but then there are various other uh, other nice properties. So, so I want to therefore separate a bit this sort of generic uh, large n story from the some special features that appear to happen in some particularly beautiful symmetric theories, which uh, which have uh, extra symmetries like supersymmetry. Uh, so let me talk about, so, so I'll kind of uh, go a little bit back and forth between, between these two, but I want to discuss, so what are, what are I think, three generic classes of large n limits that we use? So certainly Hoft limit you heard a lot about, uh, but it wasn't historically the first one. Uh, so, so historically the first one was... Uh, Historically, the first was uh, were these uh, various ON magnet models, magnet models, and these are examples of a. Uh, so these are what you would call the vector vector uh, large n behavior. Large n. So, so in these theories, the, for example, the most basic theories where you try to generalize uh, Heisenberg magnet, which has O3 symmetry, to uh, you want to find some kind of computational tool to uh, to develop some approximation scheme for the second order phase transition in in the Heisenberg magnet, and this is exactly that that type of story. So in this vector large n uh, limit, the, let me call C uh, some generalized central charge uh, number of degrees of freedom. So, so here C scales as n. Okay, so, so basically the degrees of freedom are like n vectors of some ON symmetry group. Okay, and this limit was, I think it was invented partly by Stanley, who, who is a famous uh, expert on statistical mechanics. And, uh, and basically, you're often faced with a, some kind of strongly coupled system where there is no obvious expansion parameter. And then, uh, and if you get desperate, you invent this uh, artificial expansion parameter, which is uh, 1 over n. So for example, if you want to describe the O3 model, uh, you start imagining what if one third is really a small parameter. So you formally generalize from O3 to ON and then try to develop a series of one over N corrections. Okay? Uh, so just to make it uh, more concrete, well, I'll, I'll say in a bit more detail how, how these models work. They're 
definitely probably still uh, still have the most physical application or at least they they're probably the most generic they appear in all sorts of uh, situations and uh, and the nice thing about them is that they're the large end limit is solvable and can be studied analytically so so it's really an example of solvable uh, large end behavior one over n expansion For example, if you want to go to some fixed point and develop the dimension of some operator in powers of 1 over n, it can be done. Moreover, it has been done to some pretty high order. Okay? So, so this, I think, originated in the 60s or even earlier. Okay? Then, uh, so it's a very beautiful and, and nice example of theoretical physics. Then, then there is the Toft limit, which I think uh, uh, Toft limit. Uh, you saw examples of it in uh, uh, examples of it in the Senecal four superangles, but uh, Toft didn't think about Senecal four superangles. He was just thinking about QCD or generic non-abelian gauge theory. So, so one. One reason it's so popular is that uh, it applies to, for example, SUN, uh, SUN gauge theory, uh, gauge theory, where the the, field, the gauge fields themselves are in the joint representation. Joint. Uh, in other words, you, you just have a mu, one upper and one lower index. Uh, and this you can call the, ma the matrix large n limit. So you can call this the matrix And here, uh, there is some good news and there is some bad news. So the, the good news is that uh, so it's in general reduces to planar diagrams. And this is what uh, Johanna already showed us. So there is a reduction, reduction, reduction to planar graphs. but not solvable in general. It's only solvable if there is some specific other simplification, not solvable in general. I will review a tiny bit the models that are explicitly solvable. They usually involve models of matrix degrees of freedom in very low dimensions, like in zero dimension or in one dimension. Something like this. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so so this is in some sense all has been known for a long time, uh, and and certainly certainly this ADS CFT very much relies on this uh, matrix large end limit, but it also uh, one of the amazing secrets of large uh, of this you know n equal four superangular mills or D three brain bulk duality is the possibility to dial, you have this flat direction which, uh, uh, of the coupling constant, which uh, you can interpolate between two different solvable limits, right? So, so for lambda, so for lambda much, much smaller than one can use, uh, can use uh, Feynman, usual QFT techniques, namely, Planar Feynman diagrams, for example, and and but for lambda uh, much bigger than one, just use uh, supergravity. And I think this really was the sort of the revolutionary thing, uh, like like in the thinking uh, in the like uh, when we were working on this stuff back in 97, 98. 
this was really a completely unusual thing because certainly people knew about the matrix large n limit and and so on, and people knew about the simplification. So, so one one possible thing that you can study, for example, uh, so you've already seen what type of fields there are in uh, in unequal for super n nodes, and there is one special operator called Kanishi operator, right? So, so Kanishi. So suppose you want to study the dimension of some single trace operator. Yeah, Daniel told us about the separation at large n between single and multi-trace. So there are these uh, six adjoint, six adjoint massless fields phi i, and just about the the simplest operator you can write down would be something like uh, O Kanishi, which is some from 1 to 6, uh, trace phi, phi i squared. It turns out that this is not one of these protected operators. So, so one special thing about unequal four super young mills is, um, is that there is a whole bunch of operators which are dual to kaluza klein state, which are actually symmetric traceless polynomials in, in phi i. So for example, so this is not protected. Not protected by by supersymmetry. You, you've already heard about some things that are protected, right? So the simplest uh, uh, class that are protected would be things like uh, trace phi uh, a phi i1, phi i2, the dot, dot i ik, and you have to completely symmetrize these indices and, and make them traceless. So these are symmetric traceless polynomials. So symmetric traceless polynomials, symmetric traceless. Do you know what they're dual to in this in the ADS space? Probably some of you know uh, which which states are they dual to? Hmm? Right, right. Kaluza Klein mode. So, so if you just look at uh, some some particular excitations, yeah. Luckily for ADS CFT. Uh, some people did really hard work years before the SDFT was formulated. And in particular, Kim Romans and Van Neuwenhuizen computed the complete spectrum of ADS5 process 5. And there were some particular mixtures of, <coughs> there were some particular mixtures of uh, graviton and, and uh, uh, trace, uh, graviton and dilaton excitate, no, not dilaton, but <coughs> so there are modes that have masses that corresponded to exactly these. So if you look at their dimensions, so their delta would be just k, uh, because phi has dimension uh, 1, right? So it would be k, then you compute the one loop correction, you get 0, you compute two loop, you get 0, so it's exact. So you can extrapolate from lambda being much smaller than 1 to lambda much bigger than 1 and compare boldly. And so it's a test of ADS-CFT, but it's a somewhat boring test, right? It's sort of a test on the level of just matching the, the number of states. So, so this is exact, right? So this, this we already knew pretty well already in 98 that th these tests are passed, but <coughs> there have been uh, so what have people been doing in these 19 years? Well, they worked very hard. And, and actually, one of the tests was for, was for this operator. So does anyone know what, what is the dual state to, to this? What is the dual state in ads -CFT that is dual to this? Whenever you see something like this, which is not protected, the, the candidate would be a massive string. Okay, and it turns out since this is the 
<coughs> so if you look at the spectrum of massive string states, then uh, so the spectrum of massive string states would be so massive closed string states. Massive closed strings. And they have all masses of order one over alpha prime. So in fact the, their masses would be m squared is four n divided by alpha prime. Right, and n can be one, two, up to infinity. And uh, so since this is such a simple state, it's plausible to assume that uh, that when you extrapolate it to strong coupling, you just the description of it would be here you have this this ADS space and and you drop to the center just the massive state, just the massive closed string that gets dropped and sits at the center. And we know that this uh, by the ADS CFT dictionary, delta is equal to square root of four plus ML squared plus two, right? But here, because this is just four n over alpha prime, and uh, and this is lambda is big, and uh, L to the four is is like this, so you basically see that uh, uh, that uh, this ML is just going to dominate. So so this in the limit lambda much bigger than one should start looking like two square root of n times lambda to the one quarter. Right? Plus some uh, subleading correction. Okay, so this is a pretty dramatic prediction that essentially all the states, uh, all the operators which are not protected by, by this uh, amazing symmetry of the theory, their dimensions are going to diverge when you crank up the coupling. And it's a testable prediction. So, so I think a lot of the work in these 19 years have focused on really checking is this true or not. And, and uh, so in the paper with Gapser and Pavica, we actually conjectured this, but uh, it, you know, it was a plausible conjecture, but it seemed like extremely, <laughs> would be unbelievably hard to test. So, but, so I want to just, your question? Yeah, so I just want to, so the test came from, uh, from the idea that uh, people notice that uh, just perturbative expansion, so if you, if you look at this dimension of the Kanishi operator, oh sorry, I can, there are two k's here, let me call this L. So, so this is the prediction uh, for large n a large lambda behavior. Now, if you look at the dimension of the Kanishi, of this Kanishi operator, people started computing it perturbatively, and the first few calculations were done just using graphs. So usually people introduce this new parameter, g, which is square root lambda divided by four pi, just to remove some extra junky four pi. And you get the following few terms. So from from one loop term, you explicitly find 12g squared minus 48g to the four. That's two loop. Then 336g to the six. Uh, that's three loop. Then starting four loop, uh, you start seeing zetas coming in. So there is minus 2496 plus uh, uh, 576 zeta 3 minus 1440 zeta 5. And then the, the really powerful techniques were invented to continue this perturbation the uh, theory. And I think the particular breakthrough came from the paper by Gromov uh, as a Coven Vieira. Uh, 
And these papers are really difficult to understand, but the results speak for themselves. So uh, they basically notice some properties of spin chains that are used to, to develop this, uh, this perturbation theory. Uh, and by now, I think people know to 10 loops or even beyond. Like there are simply monumental accomplishments that would be totally impossible to reproduce directly. So, so this would be including, including 10 loops. So you basically know how this function begins. And now what about on the dual side? Well, on the dual side, people weren't resting either. And in fact, uh, uh, it was possible to, uh, so by a series of tricks, they obtained the following terms here. So, so if you, for example, just look at the Kanishi, then you can set this to one. So, so one dream was to continue this as, and to check this uh, lambda two lambda to the one quarter behavior. But then people actually did use the following terms, plus two over lambda to the one quarter plus one half minus three zeta three over lambda to the three quarters plus, it's still a known coefficient over lambda to the five quarters. And I think so far that's all that's known. And uh, so the question is, if this is really one theory, is there a smooth function that, that extrapolates between the two? And by now there is, from, so from very precise uh, calculations involving these integrability solution that these people invested, uh, invented, there is now a very precise uh, plot at least, which uh, some of these plots appeared last year, but they, they see like with, so this is built in analytically and they see matching with these results to very, very high precision. So this one is uh, two is like two, I think uh, ridiculously high precision, but even these terms come out very precisely. So, so there was a paper I noticed. So one interesting paper was by Hagedush and Concher, who is a numerical, numerical solution. And this is, uh, I can give the hap th number, it's 16.04.02346. Yeah, I'll post all of this anyway. On the but you, you basically see this rather modest looking curve. Uh, st still people have not fully cracked the problem of analytic large N expansion, but uh, but this curve very clearly behaves like uh, g to the one half or lambda to the one quarter, and all of these coefficients uh, match. So I think this is sort of one of the truly smoking guns that makes us believe so much that uh, that, uh, that the theory can be continued from weak coupling, defined through the usual Feynman graph techniques, and then once you approach lambda not that high even, lambda of order 10 or something, it, uh, it becomes really described by string theory in ADS5 process 5 by the round. Yeah, question? Well, you can, I think they just solve uh, numerically for the dimension of, of K and then they, they, uh, they match they determine the, these coefficients and then compare with the analytically known coefficients. But I should say that this is a particularly difficult example for them. There was another example which was much simpler, which was uh, called uh, the Beiser and Staudacher equation. There, you could actually solve the equation of strong coupling and analytically match a similar story. But yeah, yeah question. No, they are asymptotic series. The, yeah, this is certainly, if you look at the, the, behavior, the behavior of this series, you see that 
the coefficients do start pretty rapidly uh, uh, blowing up. So, for example, where was this? Yeah, th this was. Uh, so this is uh, two here. This is about minus three point one over lambda to the three quarters. And this is already plus fifteen point five over lambda to the five quarters. So these are certainly asymptotic series, but this doesn't prevent the matching at large lambda, <laughs> right? So yeah, yeah. This this series is not. This series is convergent. This this one. Yeah, because it's planar. It's a planar uh, perturbation series. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, the, what makes it convergent is the fact that planar perturbation theory is uh, uh, is much nicer than the whole perturbation theory. This is one of the examples of the power of large n. So I should so so. One thing that should be made clear is that all of this depends on the leading large n uh, approximation. So if, for example, you, so this delta k, of course, has a correction, some other function of g, like let's call it f1 of g over n squared, and so on. And this is a whole separate function, which I think people know a lot less about, or it hasn't been computed. So, so, so this, uh, it was clear from the beginning that this matrix large n limit, by cutting down to planar graphs, it makes, uh, uh, makes the series convergent within some radius of, of the Toft coupling. So while uh, generic perturbation theory certainly diverges even for small g, this is not the case for, for this. And this is part of the reason that you can basically start with this convergent expansion and hope to analytically continue it to large G. And, and, that, and there, so it should be a well-defined mathematical problem. And, and by now, people have made uh, good progress on it in, in some particular cases. Well, you have to pick observables judiciously. I think they, they have determined some other operators in a similar way. Uh, so the the beautiful thing is so delta k this Kanishi dimension is like one of the simplest one, and it corresponds to the the sort of n equal one the lightest string state. You can look for the operator which is the next lightest. Usually the lightest one is the cleanest because it doesn't mix, can't even mix with anything and so on. But I think there is uh, I haven't kept track of that literature so much, but. Uh, they do have successes for other operators. The one, if you want to know when the biggest, in some sense, the cleanest and the biggest success is for the so-called cusp anomalous dimension, which is basically the following quantity that if you look for an operator of high spin, so the, if you look at high spin operators, high spin operators, which are like trace phi i, and then you you put in covariant derivative, say in the plus direction, uh, phi i. Then then we know that the delta will be at weak coupling will be s plus two plus some order lambda correction. So so it's another operator which is not protected. Uh, and then more generally for large s, so for large s. For large S, you get delta is S plus some function of lambda times log S plus some water S to the zero term. And this function of lambda is, uh, people call it the cusp anomaly. That's, it's related to Wilson loops with cusps in some peculiar way. But So people call it cusp anomaly function. And this one, uh, the dual state in ADS space turns out to be a long spinning string. So if you look at ADS, global ADS like this, you can have a folded string like this, which is spinning around. And this gives a, basically, 
you can see this log s divergence and you can see uh, so this tells you that for lambda much much bigger than one you find that f of lambda is uh, root lambda over pi minus 3 log 2 over pi plus some um, order 1 over root lambda and here the the story is in a way even more successful because there is an equation called the B BS equation uh, which can be solved for any coupling but you can analytically develop its strong coupling expansion and match to any desired order the, uh, the so this is a kind of stringy calculation where you have like a long spinning string then you can compute the, the kind of quantum correction to its energy then already this term is more complicated but but it all matches very beautifully so there is again some kind of weak coupling expansion for f of lambda and it matches the stringy calculation so there are a few examples like this there is no general proof but but these are certain quantities that are not protected by any obvious symmetry <laughs> so I mean the the early tests of ADS CFT like around 98 were kind of people were saying oh but how do you know that there aren't two theories two separate theories one is a theory determined defined by per perturbative expansion and superhang nulls and then the other one is this weird string theory in ADS 5 process 5 so in fact there were some skeptics who wrote papers that what if there are two functions two functions uh, delta right one of them is one function and the other one is another function they never meet but I think after 19 years we basically know that there is only one function and, and there is only one theory but I think this this particular so this relies on on many kind of confluence of many uh, big ideas I think the biggest one is still the large n because uh, because this whole integrability story is pretty much for the planar theory like it uh, is I think not known how to extend it beyond the planar limit so this is the zeroth order thing and then the other one is this flat direction that uh, allows you to to kind of go from uh, from one perturbation theory to another perturbation theory and what's in between is really complicated but uh, we don't have a full description of what's in between except in, in some uh, some cases okay so so this is uh, at least in fact uh, there was an interesting story because the integris there was a period of a couple of years when they all were saying that ADS CFT is wrong because their ansatz for the calculations wasn't general enough and they were not matching something at for loop and then suddenly they realized what was missing they obtained the matching at for loop with the with the explicit calculation and integrability and and then from then on they went from for loop to infinite loop pretty fast <laughs> but uh, okay so so this is uh, one example of power of, of large n in this particular context uh, but one thing that I uh, I really want to talk about uh, in this series of lectures so I'm giving this lecture today which is a kind of a bit of a preview and then um, and then two more lectures next week and one thing that that I'm pretty excited about now is uh, is the following fact that if you asked people say a few months ago what are the two generic sort of large n limits which don't rely on supersymmetry and just rely on counting indices they would answer two like basically one would be the vector limit and the other one would be the Toft limit All, pretty much anyone with a with few exceptions would say two uh, and uh, but now here comes the third one okay the third one is the so-called so the so limit number three, so large n, third large n limit, large n limit is the, the tensor, 
limit. Uh, rank R tensor, R tensor with with R greater than or equal to three. Now this is, uh, and in this case, uh, obviously C. So in the case of this matrix large and limit, uh, you obviously the number of degrees of freedom is going to scale like C is n squared, and here C is going to scale as as n to the r, right? Uh, Okay, so so I, like many people, were sort of misled by the following very simple idea. It was sort of this one too many kind of idea that uh, that since the the vector limit is very easy, and then the diff the complexity jumps as you go from vectors to matrices, and this obviously becomes very complicated and barely tractable and some mind-bogglingly complicated papers were written just to understand the extrapolation of some operator dimensions, uh, then what would you say? That once you go on to tensors, then you have a truly unintelligible mess. But amazingly enough, some people already knew that it wasn't the case. And, uh, and in fact, it becomes simple again. It becomes much, much simpler. It becomes uh, maybe not quite as simple as this vector limit, but vastly simpler than the planar limit. And uh, and it turns out that there is so there is uh, it simplifies again, simplifies again. And this was discovered by a group of people in France, uh, Razvan Gurau. Uh, Rivasso and uh, and many collaborators uh, and uh, recently this uh, uh, this uh, was connected with the so-called SYK uh, such the Vyakitaev models but I probably will not talk about this aspect I just want to explain why this this limit is so simple Th that's a really huge surprise and that it really the simplification occurs uh, due to uh, a specifically picked structure of the interaction, okay? So, so you have to, the secret is you have to pick the interactions uh, wisely. So, so you have to uh, pick the interactions, interactions carefully. Well, well, for uh, vectors and tensors, you don't really need to do this. There is more or less a unique way uh, way to do it. But in this tensor case, it, you have to kind of keep your wits about it. And, uh, and I wanted to explain how how this story works. So, so this tale of three large n limits. Oh, j just one disclaimer. So some of you may have heard about other large n limits, right? For example, one uh, in the discussion uh, during Daniel's talk, there was the so-called M theory limit that, that came up. Uh, so the, so the, it doesn't mean that these three limits are the only ones known. So for example, uh, there are additional uh, So there may be additional uh, nice simplifications that uh, that can occur. So, for example, in the uh, one example is the so-called M2 brain theory. M2 brain uh, uh, or ABJM, Aroni, Bergman, Jeffers, Maldacena theory. So this is widely regarded as a as a kind of Closest relative to n equal four super n mills, but in one less dimension. 
So this is a particular example in two plus one dimensions. And it's basically UN level K cross UN level minus K theory uh, coupled to matter. Coupled to massless matter. And what does this level mean? It means that there is a so-called Chern-Simons interaction. Interaction. Uh, this Chern-Simons interaction says that you have a term like k over 4 pi and uh, integral d3x a wedge dA. So this is the, the field corresponding to this gauge group, and then say minus A tilde, which D A tilde. So in this theory, the analog of Toft coupling, so analog of, of Toft coupling, it exists. Uh, and it would be lambda equal to N over K. So the standard Hoft limit uh, is, uh, so the standard Hoft limit would be uh, standard, in other words, limit number two, large end limit number two is uh, send n to infinity and k to infinity, uh, keeping lambda fixed. But the whole idea CFT duality for this theory suggests the existence of a, of a different limit where you keep k fixed and send m to infinity. And this people often call m theory limit. So this is a different story. So what happens is uh, there is so you could call it exotic or so what what does idea CFT conjecture for this theory? It says that the dual dual is uh, eleven dimensional M theory, which is supergravity souped up supergravity on the background ADS4 cross S7 mod ZK. So obviously, if you want to keep this background the same, you want to keep K fixed. So this suggests the existence, suggests existence of, of what I could call exotic exotic M theory limit where you just say K is fixed and uh, N is sent to infinity. And amazingly enough, there is strong evidence just from field theory that this limit makes sense. And in this limit, uh, the C, the number of degrees of freedom goes like N to the three halves. And there are actually, there is something called F, which is the, uh, uh, you can compute the partition function on the three-dimensional sphere for this theory. So F equal minus log Z on the three-dimensional sphere is exactly solvable, is exactly solvable. Well, it's reducible to some special finite dimensional integral. And you can really see that F goes like n to the 3 halves plus all sorts of uh, computable corrections. So, in this, uh, so this doesn't fall in this sort of generic classification. And actually, one of the things that I wonder about is this, somehow the existence of these exotic special limits is very much the, the existence of these uh, large gap theories that Daniel was, was talking about. 
The question is, do these series ever exist in the absence of uh, special symmetries like high degree of supersymmetry? And at the moment, nobody knows, but, but certainly in the cases where we do know these special limits exist, then, uh, then they appear only in non-supersymmetric theories. So I would say these two, I would gro say that there are two exotic sort of special behaviors where this large gap opens up. It's one is, uh, so, so you open up the gap in dimension, open up gap in dimension spectrum, operator dimension spectrum. I think people, there was a discussion in the previous talk, and I believe people think that this gap is of order n to the one-third, because that corresponds actually to the Planck, Planck scale. Uh, I think to some extent this has been established, but, uh, but obviously this, this limit is necessary for finding not just ADS dual, but a very weakly curved ADS dual. So the, so the question is, do you, you always need this sort of extra something to not just have ADS CFT, but have a weakly curved ADS dual? And that's sort of the ultimate dream. We don't have that many examples of this, but, uh, but that's, that's basically what I wanted to say, that there are, uh, in addition to these three generic limits, there are sort of possible additional special limits, and we want to expand the, the class of these special exotic limits. Are there any questions? Okay, so, so having said that, I want to now focus on these more generic theories. And uh, another, another comment I wanted to make is that when, when I talk about these generic theories, unlike uh, Daniel, I, I, I include theories that actually do have uh, um, non-singlet operators. Not so, so listening to the talks today, you could just think that there are only two types of operators, which are single trace and multi-trace. But but, for example, in this model, there are neither, right? There are just operators, for example, if you look at the spin operator uh, in the Heisenberg model, it's neither single trace nor double trace. It's just an operator in the vector representation. So, so this, these models, they include, uh, include the non-singlet non -singlet operators. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more. And for them, there is still like the large n is powerful. For example, if you look at if you look at the field theory, uh, yeah, if you look at the field theory description of these ON models, it's uh, it's uh, something that you can read about in Peskin and Schroeder, right? All of you have read Peskin and Schroeder, right? <laughs> uh, it's in chapter 13 where th there is a discussion of critical phenomena. And for example, if you look at uh, the following uh, theory, so suppose our goal is to uh, study these sort of ON magnets. So you make some kind of a lattice. I'll just for simplicity make it two-dimensional, although the most interesting case is when the lattice is three-dimensional. And at each lattice, you just have a classical spin pointing in some direction. And this classical spin, so you just have some energy function, which is minus j times sum over nearest neighbors of n i dot n j, right? And n is a n-dimensional vector, right? n is a vector which is acted on by this uh, n. And this, let's say it's a unit vector, so n squared is equal to 1. 
So for n equals 3, this is just the Heisenberg model, which is very common in nature because molecules can have spin and there can be these ferromagnetic. So it's ferromagnetic when... Uh, so it's ferromagnetic when j is bigger than 0. So then you can look at the partition function z, which is uh, sum over all spin configurations. Uh, e to the minus beta E, and you find the second order phase transition. Find the second order, order phase transition. And amazingly enough, this second order phase transition is described by essentially 5 4 theory, by ON symmetric 5 4 theory. And this really is in Peskin and Schroeder. So the, you, you just, uh, so you take a continuum field theory, which is valid near the second order phase transition. Continuum Q of T looks as follows. You just take the Euclidean action to be integral, say, d, d dx. Let's just for definiteness say it's three dimensional, d3x, one half gradient phi squared plus lambda over four phi i phi i squared. And then you can add a mass term like m squared over two phi i phi i. So the phase transition corresponds to the transition between two phases, which is, so for m squared bigger than zero, you have sy symmetry and broken phase, right? And for m squared less than zero, you have number Goldstone phase. So, so this uh, phase transition, let me, so, so this, uh, so phase transition separates separates the m squared bigger than zero and m squared less than zero phases. And this one is, uh, is the symmetry broken phase. Broken. And this is really has applications to nature. For example, the simplest case is uh, when n is just equal to one. Do you know, do you know what this is called? What is yeah, this is just the easing model. So when n is 1, you just take the regular 5, 4 theory, uh, and then there is a breaking of Z2 symmetry, right? And the phase transition is just the 5, 4 theory in three dimensions. Uh, so in this theory, we can certainly compute uh, dimensions of operators. So the power of large n for this model is that, for example, you can take so what are the simplest operators? Uh, this operator phi i is just like an average spin operator. You take these spins and average over some largest domain. So, so phi i is the spin operator. Spin operator and phi squared is the, the operator that uh, basically here it's the mass operator, but people call it the energy operator. So these are the two simplest ones. So this one deserves to be called a single trace operator. Right? This one is a single, uh, this is phi i phi i. So you can call this a single trace. But this one is just a non-singlet operator in the vector representation. And you can develop the the large n expansion for either one, you actually find that for this one, the leading term is exactly the three dimension, one half. Uh, and then there are some corrections like eta one over n plus eta two over n squared and so on. So, and then similarly for, for phi squared, in this case, the expansion looks like uh, uh, 
in this case it's 2 plus uh, plus some, let's call it eta 1 tilde over n plus eta 2 tilde over n squared. So, so these are maybe the most useful for physical applications because they describe actual real phase transitions. And these numbers are exactly solvable. They're, they're perfectly well computable. I'll, I'll explain briefly how, how they're computed. But for that, we first have to understand why this theory simplifies so much. So, so strictly speaking, this theory by itself is not, does not have any simple idea, dual ideas description because it includes, it's not gauged. So even though gauging maybe in some deep sense is not, but for this model, you know exactly what it means to gauge it. You, you can actually, Xi Yin invented this. <laughs> uh, you, you, uh, you can couple this ON model to an ON Chern Simons gauge field. And that completely removes this operator from the spectrum, but keeps this operator and certain other ones. And that model uh, is basically what Polyakov and I conjectured to what its dual ADS description, but it does not have a large gap. It's, it's one of these higher spin ADS CFT duals. But even if you don't gauge anything and you have these non-singlet operators, large N is still a very useful and powerful thing. And you can, and one of the points of comparison for this is the, the recent bootstrap results. So, so while Monte Carlo calculations don't go usually to very high end, the bootstrap actually is no problem to, con to continue to large end, and they obtained excellent matching with these one over n calculations. I should also mention that probably Silvio Pufu will will talk about this. Uh, yes. Just to clarify, mm. the lambda is no lambda is dimension full. Uh, so if you go to, to a, for example, if you're working directly in three dimensions, right, lambda has dimensions of, of mass. So in some sense, you can say that lambda flows to infinity, right? It's, it's just a relevant operator. The picture of RG flow is like this. When you, you can tune this relevant operator to zero, then you just have a free CFT, right? So the picture of RG flows is, uh, is like this. This is, uh, this actually, it's something that was known long ago, but for some strange reason, many people forgot it, and now it sort of came back, in, uh, partly because of bootstrap or partly for lack of anything better to do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. But, <laughs> 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 but it, it's something that was known in, uh, definitely to Ken Wilson. I mean, uh, it's called Wilson-Fisher approach. Or yeah, so the, the picture is like this. So you have uh, the free UV CFT, free UV CFT. That just has lambda equals zero, and it just has three fields, right? Then you turn on this relevant perturbation. The important thing is to fine tune the mass squared to zero, right? That's to, so there is one operator that needs to be fine tuned, which is m. But once you've done that, so generically you'll just flow to a massive phase. But if you fine tune the flow, you get this uh, interacting. You can call this Wilson Fisher CFT. Wilson Fisher CFT. And this is, in some sense, as your question, uh, it, it should be very strongly coupled because lambda, in some sense, here you have lambda equal infinity. And that's where the large n approach is useful or could be useful because you could just develop large n expansion at the CFT. So these, these things that I wrote here are exactly for this interacting large MC. At the free CFT, this delta phi is exactly one half and, and delta phi squared is one. So, so at free CFT, at free CFT, uh, what you have is a delta phi i just one half 
and delta phi squared is one. So you see that that uh, the fact that that this goes from one to two is a sign of strong coupling. But somewhat mysteriously, the most other dimensions don't flow very far. So naively, you would say that these theories should be somehow far from each other. But the actual number, for example, if you look at the numbers for for these. Uh, for example, for here, you find that delta phi for the 3D easing is about 0 0.518. And this is amazingly close to 0.5. So a lot of dimensions don't change under this flow. And you, so you could sort of, if you're an optimist, you could say that large n explains qualitatively why a lot of dimensions don't change. Even though quantitatively it's maybe not so great for small n, but so if you're a large a fan of large n, you would say that in this zeroth approximation it should still be one half, and and the exact number is very very close to one half. So so large n is good for these models, if not quantitatively. It's but qualitatively, it becomes quantitatively excellent for n starting around 7 or 8. And, and I'll show this plot. Uh, okay. Any more questions? Uh, so <coughs> so let, let me just <coughs> talk then about... So when you look at this theory, you, you could just say... Well, this theory is just a particular variant of 5-4 theory, right? You simply take, uh, take n fields and construct interactions for these fields in a, in a specific sort of O-n invariant way. For vector interactions, uh, this is the only thing you can write down, right? And it's a so-called double trace, right? Because it's a square of a single trace operator. So the only thing you can write down for vector is this uh, double trace. So this is double trace. And now you can keep playing this game for, for uh, matrices and for tensors. And for there you basically have uh, more freedom. Uh, and, uh, and I want to explain basically how you can use this freedom to, uh, to, to help construct a whole new large n limit. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, I, th I think this does not, uh, then, yeah, yeah, that that leads to a free theory, I believe. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think for finite time the beta function is positive. Yeah. But if you do it in three minus epsilon dimension, then you do get an IR fixed point. But but yeah, so strictly in three dimensions the uh, there is no like C of T for this. Just just like for example, if you if you look at this theory in four dimensions, right? This is known not to produce any CFT. If has has any of you looked at uh, the Wilson Colgate review? I highly recommend it. I mean, it it was uh, written in the heyday of this stuff, and and you get really inspired. First of all, some of these results are already in, there. <laughs> and the review was uh, it was based on many many lectures that that Wilson gave at Princeton University, I believe it was in the year 1973 or 4, something like that. Yeah, he was visiting the institute and apparently David, David Gross told him, you can give as many lectures as you want. And then he gave something like 17 lectures in a row. <laughs> and, and Kogat was a postdoc at the time and he uh, he took very good notes, and then together they turned it. It's a truly historic uh, document, which, I if you really want to, 
learn about how RG was born and how RG approached to critical phenomena. It's a great place to look at. And one of the things that they really agonize about is, is there a, a fixed point in four dimensions? Like they, they try to really squeeze out some kind of fixed point behavior out of this, and, and they couldn't. I mean, basically this theory is, is just infrared three in four dimensions, whichever way you slice it. And the only fixed point that we do know about is this so-called caswell bank zacks fixed point, which, uh, wow, that's yet another large end limit. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's called the Veneziano limit, but I, I'll stay away from that for, for the moment. Th there you just basically add an F species of quarks, uh, and then you take the limit where both n is sent to infinity, the number of colors, and an f is sent to infinity. And if you just fine-tune the ratio, then you can end up in the fabled conformal window, which actually was was a, was a amazing paper by Bill Caswell in 1974, and he was a student of Kurt Collins, and he computed the two-loop beta function. And then he realized that when you add 16 flavors of quarks, when the theory is base, barely asymptotically free, the two-loop contribution is positive, and you get a weakly, very, very weakly coupled fixed point. And, and that has been confirmed by lattice results. Uh, Tom DeGrand, actually, I highly recommend, he wrote a review of modern physics about the search for conformal windows, so it's a great resource. So all these conformal, so yeah, I should add, I'm not sure I sh if I should call it an exotic or generic. I think it's somewhere in between, <laughs> but, but. <laughs> right, right, yeah, they, I tend to call them caswell bank Yeah, so, so there are also these, uh, so if you really want to be in D equal four, CFT without SUSY, Without supersymmetry, the only uh, the only known possibility known is the so-called uh, Caswell bank sacks and they consist of like SUN gauge theory, SUN with with an F. Uh, quarks, massless quarks, in the Veneziano limit. Veneziano limit. And the Veneziano limit is basically an F going to infinity, an F, both N and an F sent to infinity, and this ratio X, which is uh, an F over NC, uh, spe specially chosen. You, you have to choose it very, very specially. Specially chosen. So without this kind of gymnastics, it's extremely hard to get conformal behavior in even dimensions. And uh, or, yeah, because usually beta functions are positive and there is nothing to defeat them and, and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I should also also mention since all of you have read uh, uh, since all of you have read Peskin and Schroeder, <laughs> uh, and Dan specifically wanted me to talk about epsilon expansion. Uh, so, so for example, if you just let you know you go over about three minutes now. Okay, okay, so let me just finish in a minute. Yeah, essentially, the thing I wanted to say is the following, that that in addition to large N expansion, these type of models also have something called the Wilson-Fisher epsilon expansion. Wilson-Fisher 4 minus epsilon expansion. And essentially, it's based on the following fact that that if you compute the beta function for this coupling, it has the term minus epsilon lambda in addition to the positive term, which is n plus 8, uh, 
lambda squared divided by 8 pi squared. And then there are some higher order corrections. And then you see that for any n, so if you look at this, uh, you see that uh, there is an IR fixed point. So, so there is an IR fixed point. So, so while, so this actually ties to your question very much because while in three dimensions lambda looks like it just goes to infinity, in four minus epsilon this flow is very short. Like you still have the UV fix, so this is the picture in four minus epsilon. There is U UV CFT, and here the IR CFT is very weakly coupled. It just sits at the coupling. So when you solve this equal to zero, you find that lambda star is only uh, epsilon, uh, so it's 8 pi squared divided by n plus 8, plus some higher order corrections. So you see that it's actually suppressed both by the small epsilon and by the large n. And this formula is in Pascal and Schroeder, so I don't need to give a another reference, but you, you learn one important thing that when you take the large n limit of these vectorial theories, you also need to do something similar to the Toft limit. Namely, you have to take lambda to be of order 1 over n. So this large n limit, so the vectorial large n limit, large n, is uh, where lambda is taken to be of order 1 over n. And it's similar to Toft, who took gn mil squared to be of order 1 over n. And then just the one final thought as an appetizer, since I didn't get to start about tensor models, is, for example, if you take a model of the rank 3 tensor phi ABC and write down a particularly chosen interaction of the form, let me just write it down, G phi I1, A1, B1, C1, phi A1, B2, C2, phi A1, A2, B1, C2, phi A2, B2, C1. Then something, so you just take this special index contraction, you find that there is a, there is a, large n limit where uh, g has to be taken to go like n to the minus 3 halves. And then a very small type of, uh, of diagrams dominate called Mellon diagrams. Then so-called, so the simplest Mellon diagram is like this. Yeah, the, uh, so Mellon, Mellons dominate. in this limit. Well, it turns out that in this limit, the dominant, say, propagator correction is the so-called snail. So, so here, the, in this vectorial large n limit, uh, you just have snail dominance. So, so, so here is basically, in a nutshell, the story is like a battle of snails and melons. Uh, <laughs> In the vectorial limit, snails win. Then, for matrices, it's a draw, kind of. They both are important. And then, in this limit, amazingly enough, snails lose and melons win. 